Hey, welcome back everybody to part two of how to properly select a camshaft. So in the first video, I'll put it a, a link down here if you haven't seen that. We talked about the camshaft's lift, the camshaft's duration, the piston speed as it relates to what duration you need, the factors that you need to know to basically pick the lift and duration of your cam. Today, we're gonna shift gears a little bit. I wanna talk to you about a few other things that are factors in cam selection. One of the things you need to think about is overlap. Now, overlap is defined as the period of time that the intake and exhaust valves are open at the same time at the end of the exhaust stroke and the beginning of the intake stroke. So there's a transitionary period there. You have your four strokes, intake, compression, power, exhaust. On the exhaust stroke, the piston is moving up and exhaust gases are being forced out the exhaust port. As you approach top dead center, the exhaust valve is going to start to close, but before the exhaust valve fully closes, the intake valve is going to open. And now you have a situation where both the intake and exhaust valves are open at the same time. One of the reasons that we do this is to help scavenge the cylinder. Now the, the definition of scavenging is the draw that's on the exhaust pulls on that intake valve. It pulls on that intake charge and helps to actually pull it in. Now this is, remember, this is happening on the exhaust stroke. So now what's happening is I'm getting a big head start on my air fuel into the cylinder before my intake stroke even starts. So overlap is a thing. Pretty much all engines have overlap. Some have more than others. Now the issue is when we get too much overlap it can actually have negative effects on performance and and you know I, I have customers or guys that say oh, I, I like that choppy idle you know I like that old school idle overlap is actually what creates that when you have a, a, a lot of overlap and there's a couple of things that there's a couple of specs we have to look at that are going to cause overlap but honestly in modern engines and what I'm going to do in this video is I'm going to give you some camshaft spec for the LS based engines I'm go, I'm going to actually tell you what cam is going to work in your LS motor the best because we've done tons and tons of dyno testing with all kinds of camshafts we've gone from mild all the way to crazy wild and for the the LS based engines, especially the earlier ones, the LS1, the 4.8, the 5.3, the cathedral port type heads, I'm actually going to tell you what camshaft is going to be the most effective. And I will also tell you what's going to be too big and not going to work. So we'll get to that a little bit later. But overlap, again, is an event that creates cylinder scavenging. Now, when you have poor flowing heads and you put in a cam that has more overlap, it's going to help them. This is why, like back in the day when we had the old crappy cast iron heads that for, for some reason, I don't know why the American car companies made such crappy heads back in the 70s and 80s. I, I don't know what they were thinking because the efficiency level of the engines were just in the toilet and they just didn't make the power. So we would put big radical choppy idly cams in those and put a big four barrel on it and a big single plane intake with a set of headers and we would literally you know, just zing the motor up in RPMs and force the thing to like flow air through it. Well, when you get into the newer engines today that have really well designed heads and very good flowing heads like the LS based motors, you don't really need to have a, as big of a radical cam like that to make those heads flow because they already flow. In fact, most guys, very, very easy to over cam an LS motor. You don't really need a, a super radical cam. And when you get too big on some of those specs, the lift and duration and, and the lobe separation and things like that, you, it's, it, it, the thing actually runs like a dog. It really does. I, I, I've seen so many LS motors where guys put these giant cams in them and you, know, you ask them how they run or you drive the car and it's like, man, this thing is a pooch. It just does not run. Basically, they're being overcamped. All right, so I want you to think about overlap like this. We are on the exhaust stroke. Now, what's happening is the exhaust, of course, is being pushed out the exhaust here. We have this residual, ex these exhaust molecules left over in the cylinder here, all this burnt exhaust. The exhaust valves has started to close, but now the intake valve, oh, the exhaust system over here has an incredibly powerful draw, or at least it's supposed to. So. The, the scavenging effect of the exhaust pulse is very powerful if the exhaust is designed right. Now, one of the things that can diminish this 
and I see guys do this all the time is they put too big of an exhaust on. Oh, I got a three inch exhaust, you know, on my 305 or whatever, you know, with a big long tube with, with shorty headers and big tubes. Well, restriction to flow creates velocity over here. If your exhaust system is too big, it actually creates less draw on the exhaust side. Now, I'm not saying that bigger exhaust is not going to help your engine because generally, the exhaust systems on the factory exhaust systems are generally very restrictive. So usually we can go a little bigger, but you don't want to go too big on your exhaust, especially if you have a smaller cubic inch motor, because that is going to diminish the amount of draw that you have here. If you don't believe me, um, uncork your pipes from your exhaust manifolds on your stock car and drive around with just exhaust manifolds. You have no scavenging whatsoever, and that thing's going to run like dog poop. So. The air fuel is drawn in by the exiting exhaust pulse or velocity and the incoming air and fuel that's coming in here helps to evacuate the exhaust, the residual exhaust out of the cylinder. So everything is moving from the intake over to the exhaust and this is before I've even gotten to my, this is before I've even gotten to my intake stroke. Now camshaft selection really has an effect on this because you can get a camshaft that has a lot more overlap. But if I get too big on my overlap, and I am gonna get a choppy idle with that, what that does is it moves the power band up higher. In other words, the camshaft is really not gonna, if it, down there where that engine's running high, idling choppy, it's not gonna really make any power, right? So overlap, you gotta, you gotta really consider this. And the better flowing your head is, the less overlap you need. So really what we're trying to create here, guys, is we're, tr we're trying to create cylinder pressure. We're trying to build a lot of cylinder pressure. Well, the bigger the overlap, the more that the overlap event is going to interfere with the combustion process. So at low RPMs, when this piston is moving relatively slow, if I have big overlap, it's going to bleed a lot of pressure out of that cylinder because the valves are open for so long here, right? And that's why the engine runs choppy because the valve opening during overlap is interfering with the combustion process and it causes low compression on the cylinder and it basically runs rough, right? So overlap is, is a thing and we need it for scavenging, but I would caution you, especially on the, the newer engines that have really good flowing heads you don't need a gob of overlap this is an old school thinking i have a i have a buddy named larry and he is the most old school guy you've ever heard of he hates electronics he hates fuel injection he thinks the new motors are terrible and he's he still likes the old camel hump chevys and the 327s nothing against them they're great motors i'll probably never stop building the old classic small blocks or in big blocks but the fact of the matter is is that's really old technology it, it just the, the the heads are just absolute garbage they are the only thing that those old heads are good for anymore is a classic car restoration they are they just don't flow compared to what we have now and compared to aftermarket heads so I want to caution you on overlap you don't need a ton of overlap even though it sounds cool and it idles rough, you really got to watch that because you're losing cylinder pressure at low RPM and it kind of makes the engine run like a dog. I've, I've, I had a guy bring me a, a, a big block Chevelle like last year and it had an LS swap in it. It had a Corvette LS motor in it and he had a big giant monster cam in it that was idling rough and, and you know that car ran terrible. It just did not run good. We ended up doing a cam swap and we backed the cam way off and I think we probably gained 80 to 100 horsepower. That's what I would caution you about overlap. Now, there's a couple of things that affect overlap. I kind of touched on lobe separation in the last video. So we got these lobes on this camshaft. Lobe separation is how far apart these lobes are separated. It's basically the distance from the center line of the intake lobe to the center line of the exhaust, right there. Now, if I widen lobe separation out, let's say I take these lobes 
And when I manufacture this cam, I widen that out. So instead of having, I don't know, 104 here, let's say this is 104 degrees of lobe separation, I stretch that out, I come way out here, I put the lobe centers out here, and I make this 114. So now instead of, I have, I've added 10 degrees of lobe separation. Well, right here, you guys, where the camshafts intersect, this is your overlap. So when these two lobes intersect, as one is, one is closing and one is opening, right in here, this area is gonna cause your overlap. If I widen out that lobe separation, it's gonna diminish your overlap. I'm separating these out so that the area where the lobes intersect gets wider and that diminishes my overlap. That's going to do a couple of things for me. Number one, wide lobe separation is going to smooth out the idle. It's also going to cause higher cylinder pressures at lower RPMs. So because I don't have that big overlap event, I'm not bleeding all that pressure out of those cylinders at low RPM and I actually create a lot more cylinder pressure at lower RPMs, which cylinder pressure is what we want. That's what we're looking for. And again, in the old days, we liked a lot of overlap because the heads were so crappy. Nowadays, you don't really need gobs of overlap. That's why, you know, when you, when you go out and you buy one of these newer cars, let's say you buy a Camaro SS with a 6.2 in it, it doesn't have a rough idling cam, but it makes crazy horsepower mainly because of, of the design of the cylinder heads and the amount of airflow. It's all about the air. So we can, we can widen out the lobe separation and we can create more cylinder pressure, which makes a really good running engine. If I tighten up the lobe separation, that is actually going to create more, uh, that's going to create a situation where I have less cylinder pressure at low RPM but it does give the cam higher RPM capability, right? If you want to zing the thing to the moon, but uh, if you're John Force or somebody like that, then all you care about is top end, all out, high end power. But in a street car, really not feasible. They have a bit of an idle, but it's not this crazy radical idle that, that's almost undrivable. Okay, so now let's get down to the nitty gritty here. Here's a concept that you have to get. Camshaft, selection, the, the specs on your cam, the lift, the duration, the overlap, the lobe separation, it all is dependent on what size of an engine that you have, right? The smaller the engine, the less cam you need. The bigger the engine, the bigger cam you need. Here's an example. Let's, let's take two engines here. I've got I don't know, a three liter V6 that has, say, a three and a half inch diameter cylinder, okay? So my engine has it, it all of those cylinders combined displace three liter. Over here, we have an eight liter, right? So this is a 496, 502, whatever. It's just a big, giant, big block. It has a big cylinder, displaces a lot of area. So here's the thing. With this engine here, I have to fill this space with air and fuel. With this, this engine, I have to fill this space with air and fuel. I have a much larger area to fill, so I'm going to need a larger camshaft to create the same performance or the same efficiency out of that cylinder. So the bigger the engine, the bigger camshaft you need. This is why, you know, your, your buddy says, hey, I got XYZ cam in my, in my you know, 5.4 liter or whatever. Oh, it works great. I rode in it. You know, it's fantastic. I rode in his truck with a 5.4 and he's got a cam in it. It's so badass. I'm going to go buy the same cam for my 8 liter. That's not how it works. The cam that works well in a 5 liter, 5.4, 5.2, whatever, is gonna run like dog poopy in an eight liter, right? So it depends on the size of the engine. And you know, a lot of this, we learned through dyno testing. 
We really do. And, and I'm gonna, like I said, I'm gonna give you the what I have come to the conclusion that is the best cam for the LS series of engines, each one. And they're different. The 4.8 cam is much different than the 6.0, right? You can't put the same cam. You put the camshaft that we're getting optimal cylinder efficiency and power in the 6.0, in the 6.2, in a 4.8, and it's way too big. It doesn't run right. So this is a concept that you've got to understand. The size of your cam is highly dependent on how much cylinder area you are trying to fill. So that hopefully that's a pretty easy concept to understand. When I give you duration numbers, I'm not going to give you the advertised number. We're going to look at duration, uh, actual duration, or what we call duration at 50,000 of, of valve lift. All right, so you guys that have the 4.8, let's talk about the 4.8. And, and, you know, these numbers can apply to other manufacturers other than General Motors if the head flow is the same. And the head flows are very similar. If you look at the 5.7 liter Hemi that's in the Dodge Rams, and you compare that to the LS1 head, the flow numbers are identical on the late model Hemi and the LS series of engines. The 5.7 and the 5.7, they almost have identical flow numbers and these camshafts work very well in the Hemi as well. If you look at the Ford Mustang engines, that's kind of a different deal because it's a dual overhead cam thing with variable cam timing. So there's some other issues there, but a lot of the same stuff applies assuming that the heads flow pretty much the same. And they, they all do, all the newer heads. Uh, if you have just a plain Jane Hemi, or you have a 5.0 Mustang, or you have a, an LS motor, they, they all flow pretty much the same. All right, so what I recommend on all of these engines, because the, the head flow is identical, if you have the cathedral port heads, we want to see about 600 lift. These heads flow really well to 600 lift. Beyond 600, the, the differences are nominal. We've tried up to like 680, 700 lift, and we really didn't gain much. I mean, the amount of stress that that puts on the valve train, and the extra work you got to do to, for, the, for the springs and everything, the gains were not significant. We've really seen the best performance at about 600 lift. And that's with both of them because the percent of flow, now we talked about the percentage of flow in the last video. The percentage of flow is really good on these heads. It's above 75%. When I have more than 75% of flow, and, and what we say when we talk about percent of flow, percent of flow is we're talking about what percentage of the intake valve this is my intake here what percentage of the intake valve does the exhaust flow they're 75 percent or higher which is really good then when we have 75 percent of flow or more we want a single profile cam or in other words we want the lift on the intake and exhaust to be the same in the last video, I talked about how that if we had really crappy flowing exhaust here, real low percent of flow, we would usually want more lift and duration over here to help out that exhaust. And even if, even with this flow, we still when we look at duration, we still want to bump the exhaust duration up a little bit. Okay, so on the 4.8 liter, this is what I would recommend for duration. Now, this is actual duration, not advertised. This is off of the seat duration, actual duration on our intake. You don't want any more than about 218 degrees of actual duration on the intake. And the exhaust, we bumped that up a little bit. We want about 223 degrees of actual duration. Now, the other thing is that lobe separation I talked about, right? We talked about lobe set. This is critical. You'll notice that the lobe separation is pretty wide. 113, 114 is where you want to see this that is going to diminish your overlap and increase cylinder pressure and again i know you got to get the you, you old school guys you got to get the old school thinking out of your head because i know a lot of you thinking oh yeah but you know my cam has got really tight lobe separation and it sounds badass you know i get it 
but it's going to run like dog poop. Okay, it, I, I'm telling you, um, this is not my first rodeo. So we've dyno tested and built a lot of these things and the, the wider lobe set actually works very good. You're going to get really good cylinder pressure down low. Now if you have a truck, let's say you have a Tahoe or a Suburban or something, you might want to back this duration off just a little bit. Next we got the 5 liter which is basically <clears throat> um, engine size wise 327. So on the intake and exhaust, you'll notice a reoccurring theme here, 600 lift, 600, 600. Remember, we got really good percent of flow. It's like 89% on the, on the Cathedral Port 5.3 head. Very, very good head. 600 seems to be like the magic number, 580 to 600 lift. This is where you want to be. 223, 227 duration, actual duration. If you're in a, a Tahoe or a truck, you probably want to back this off some. Maybe um, back down to like 219, 220, and then 223 over here. You might, you could even back it off into the this cam that we have for the 4.8 here. And a 112, 113 lobe separation is where we're at on these. But for max power, and this, and this cam, I mean, some, you get some of the guys are like, well, I want the old school idle. Well, the, these are definitely going to have some old school. They, these have enough of an idle to make most people happy. Honestly, 113, 114 lobe set is better because that's going to widen it out and it's going to smooth out the idle. For a truck, man, a heavy vehicle, you don't want a, a cam that has a, a, a rough idle. You want a low-end torque. You want that thing to be able to move. So we want to, we want to keep that, that overlap diminished. And again, with these heads, you don't need a gob of overlap. We don't need exhaust to pull in air. We don't need to scavenge massive amounts of, exa massive amounts of exhaust with a big old duration and a big old overlap event because the heads flow so well. So they're actually going to run worse. They're actually going to run a lot better if you diminish that overlap. Trust me, we, we've been over this and over this at nauseam. And I'll be honest with you, when I first started working on the LS, like, I don't know, 15 years ago, I didn't really understand this concept. I kept trying to put big giant duration cams in these things and I'm like, oh, we're really going to make these run. The bad thing about it is they didn't. Um, another thing is the intake manifolds. You know, a lot of the aftermarket intakes for the LSs, we've done all kinds of dyno tests with them. The reality is that factory intake is a really, really good design. And very often we will put on aftermarket intakes and they make less power than the actual factory intake on these things. So it's a really, really good, really well-designed engine from the factory. And so we don't have to do crazy modifications to make this thing, you know, produce big numbers. All right, so let's move on to the 5.7 and the 6.0. Pretty close as far as camshaft goes for the 5.7 and the 6.0. All right, 5.7 and 6.0, again, 600 lift, 226, 226 degrees of actual duration, 234 on the exhaust. You can bump that up a little, 228, 236. So, you know, and all these numbers, like when I say 600 lift, don't look for cams as well, this, this cam is, you know, 610 lift. He said 600, okay? When we say 600 lift, 580, 590 to 620, yeah, I, I really don't like to see that spread out 20 thousandths more or less. 590 to 610 is optimal. 600 is our target number. Plus or minus 10 thousandths is not going to matter. Now, um, you also, you guys, you got to ask yourself what you're doing. Again, do you have a Tahoe or you have a Camaro? You have an old school car that you're doing an LS upgrade in? What we like to see is a, in a bigger, heavy, heavier vehicle, Say you got big tires and you got you want to do off-roading or whatever, you want to push the lobe separation out to 114, maybe even 116. 114 though is is pretty good. 110 to 112 if you want a little more radical idle and you want uh, you know you want a little more top end, you want to zing it up. You got a lighter car, so so this is really where you want to be with these camshafts. These work really well. Now I, I don't know everything. Okay, so. I'm sure there's some guys that are going to be on there. It's like, well, you know, I did this and that, and it worked great. And and I'm sure that's great. 
Uh, I should there's there's this is not all there is to it But I can tell you that if you stick with this you're gonna be very happy These camshafts are gonna make power that is very very respectable And it's this is true seat of the pants power for these LS based engines it, They really do work well You don't want to get out of these parameters really way too big or much smaller the factory cams that they put in these motors they were designed for fuel economy and emissions. Really can improve a lot on these LS-based motors with a cam swap. And keep in mind, you're probably gonna have to swap the springs out too. It's gonna be a whole cam kit, so that, that should be obvious. So I hope this helps you. Now, one other thing that I wanna talk to you about here is I wanna talk about valve events. When you're selecting a camshaft, the valve events is something that you kinda gotta look at too. The cam manufacturers have done a really good job of kinda optimizing the valve events. The, the most important valve event that there is is intake valve closing. When I close that intake valve in relationship to where my piston is, that has a dramatic effect on power. Okay, so my intake valve here, the, the piston is gonna go through its four stroke cycle. So generally, I mean, if you think about it during overlap, the intake valve is actually op gonna open on the exhaust stroke, right? So I'm still coming up on the exhaust stroke, my intake valve opens. And again, we don't need gobs of overlap. So the intake valve is gonna open on the exhaust stroke. My piston is gonna come up through top dead center and it's going to go down. The valve is opening on the intake stroke and I'm pulling in air and fuel into the cylinder. Now where I close that valve is important because, and it's really difficult to judge this depending on what engine you have, depending on your compression ratio, depending on your intake and exhaust system and all that stuff. So the piston is going to come up on the compression stroke right with a really good flowing head i can actually hold that valve open a little bit longer because i have so much air flowing into this cylinder here that even though the piston is starting up on the compression stroke i'm really not pushing the air that's up here yet i'm actually i've actually got flow coming in here so if i close that valve too early i'm giving away air i'm not giving as much air as i could but if i close it too late right now the piston has started acting, exerting on the compression, on the air fuel, and it starts to push it back out the intake tract. So that's really the key, is where that thing closes. And as a general rule, we want it to close on the compression stroke, 15 or 20 degrees after bottom dead center, when I start up, I wanna close that valve so I can trap the mixture. And again, you don't have to close it later than that, really with a good flowing head, because I've already, blasting a bunch of air in there my head's flowing good some of the bigger camshafts are going to close out a lot later and i see guys with these big camshafts and, and they're actually losing the ability to compress their air fuel and they all they've also got air and fuel being pushed back out especially at low rpm because they have such a giant cam you don't really need all of that so that intake valve closing event is really critical another issue that we have is exhaust valve opening exhaust valve opening okay so exhaust valve opening is a little bit different now we have something we have something called cylinder blowdown now the definition of cylinder blowdown is this in a race engine let's say you got like a pro stock or something it's a naturally aspirated race engine the goal with the engine builders especially at high rpm is to so i've got these events intake compression boom power so now I'm on my power stroke. My piston is on the power stroke. I'm on my way down. If I have a well-tuned exhaust system that scavenges the cylinder very, very well, I can open my exhaust valve a little bit earlier. When I'm about two thirds of the way down the bore, let's say my top dead center point is here, my bottom dead center is here, I'm about two thirds of the way down. Listen, the fire's out. The piston is simply traveling down from the inertia of the pressure that was exerted on it by the expanding gases when they ignited. So when I'm about two thirds of the way down the bore, I want to open my exhaust valve then. Because remember, the exhaust valve has an incredible draw. Now, we can increase the draw that the exhaust has by putting a better exhaust on. 
headers do a very good job of increasing the draw on that cylinder. Here's the thing, I have burnt exhaust in here now. I want to evacuate as much of that burnt exhaust out of that cylinder as I can before the exhaust stroke starts, right? So I've got this exhaust ports and I've got all of these header pipes that are scavenging and pulling on these exhaust ports. When I open that valve, those exhaust mo molecules are gonna start to blast out that header tube, even while I'm still on my way down on the power stroke. Now, stock cams aren't very good at this. They usually open that valve too late or later than it should. And there's reasons for that, for emissions and, and all, there's all kinds of reasons for it. The manufacturers, the engineers, I don't want to get into all that because honestly a lot of that stuff is like over my head. Um, this really is rocket science here. But we, uh, we do know that cylinder blowdown, so talk about the pro stock for a second. Pro stocks will have 100% cylinder blowdown. What that means is the intake and exhaust systems are designed so well that from the point where the exhaust valve opens, and honestly, exhaust valve probably opens a lot sooner than it does with a, with a street motor. From the point where the exhaust valve opens right here to bottom dead center, they will almost completely evacuate the entire cylinder using scavenging from the exhaust system. Now, this does a couple of things. Number one, it makes the engine produce a lot more power because Remember, these exhaust molecules in here, they are solid pieces of matter. They are a gas, right? But if you look at them at the molecular, molecular level, say that 10 times fast, they are actually physical pieces of matter or molecule. The more that is left in that cylinder after I start up on my exhaust stroke, the more pumping work the engine has to do to physically push that exhaust out. Hopefully that makes sense. So if I get a camshaft that opens this valve sooner rather than way down here like a stock cam, I'm going to start to scavenge that cylinder and I'm going to start to evacuate a lot more of that exhaust and that frees up horsepower because I don't have to physically pump it out. Now, this is highly dependent on a well-designed exhaust system. The length and diameter of the header pipes and header tubes is critical because the scavenging effect actually uses negative pressure waves. Okay, so there's a lot going on here. So when it comes to, here's your header pipe. So we're just gonna look at one header pipe. I know this is really short. The header pipes are usually longer. But here's the thing. Every time there's an exhaust pulse in here, right? And remember, this is going really fast. This is happening, I mean, if you're doing 6,000 RPMs, you got 50, 50 exhaust strokes in one second on every cylinder. So that, that's, that's a, this thing is moving. That means the piston's going through the four-stroke cycle 50 times per second. So you got all these exhaust pulses on this so what happens is you get a shock wave. An exhaust pulse is a sound wave. It's a compression wave and it's basically moving at the speed of sound. So you got these pulses. Every time that comes up, there's a pulse that comes down here. Each one of these is an exhaust pulse. Now you get down here, when these exhaust pulses get to the collector where, all, where, where they expand, what happens is they hit the collector and they expand rapidly. Well, when they expand, for every action, there's an equal and opposite reaction. We understand that. The expansion of that wave actually sends a negative pressure wave back up the header tube to the exhaust valve. So this thing expands here, boom. And now, we'll draw it down here. I have a negative pressure wave, and there's, there's a bunch of waves, and they're traveling back and forth. They're reverberating from the collector to the valve. A well-tuned exhaust system is going to put this pressure wave. When this pressure wave comes in, 
your exhaust valve is closed here, what we want is we want that negative pressure wave to come back, hit the exhaust valve, boom, and when it hits it, it bounces off and it goes back toward the collector. So this pressure wave is bouncing between the collector and the valve. Boom, 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 boom. And, and a lot, that's actually what you hear when the engine's running. When you got headers or whatever, you got loud exhaust. It, you, what you hear is you hear all these pulses and the exhaust is going boom, 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 boom. Actually, what you're hearing is you're hearing shock waves reverberating back and forth in that header. That's why it sounds that way. So what I want is I want my shock wave to come back from the collector, hit the valve, bounce off, and turn around and head back again. Once that shock wave hits the exhaust valve and bounces off, this shock wave has a lot of energy here. If I can tune my exhaust, right, and if I have a longer header tube, that means that it's going to take longer time for that shock wave to get from the collector back here, and that generally puts my shock wave back at the valve at a lower RPM. So it scavenges the cylinder better. And this is why long tube headers work better at lower RPMs. They make more power because what I'm doing is I am using that shock wave. So let's say my shock wave came up, boom, it hits the valve, turns around, it's got all this energy now that's headed deflected back to the collector. And just as I do that, guess what my exhaust valve does? My exhaust valve opens and it is in overlap, right? It's opening, my exhaust valve opens. This is my exhaust valve opening event. At the same time down here, my piston is on its compression stroke and I have all this exhaust in here. That, listen, that compression wave has a lot of energy and that compression wave actually pulls very hard on that cylinder and it will do a very good job of scavenging that cylinder. So this is why the exhaust system, the header length, and the design of the headers is important. We call it a tuned exhaust system. The definition of a tuned exhaust system is the exhaust system is going to put the shock wave at the valve just before the valve opening, turn around and scavenge the cylinder in the RPM range where the cam is making its optimal power, right? It's only going to hit the valve and bounce off in a certain RPM range. It's either going to be really high if I have big, short headers, or it's going to be at a low RPM if I have smaller, long tube headers. Getting these two events, now finding out exactly when that happens in a particular engine is difficult or what RPM range it is, but as a general rule, if you want your engine to run really good and you have a mild camshaft, like in a Tahoe or a Suburban or something, you want a long header. You want a smaller tube, long header. Small tube for more velocity. Restriction to flow creates velocity. If I had a garden hose here, and I turn around and you were across the room and went, ha, you know, and the water's running on the floor here, you wouldn't be worried about it. But if I take and I restrict the garden hose with my thumb, what happens in that hose is restriction to flow creates pressure. Pressure's gonna build up in that hose and now I got velocity and I'm gonna spray the guy across the room. The same thing happens in here. A smaller tube header is a restriction to flow. Now we don't want it too small because then it's gonna choke everything off. But we don't want this big giant header tube here because the problem is we don't have enough restriction to flow and the exhaust gases slow down. So we want the header tube diameter sized right. As a general rule, you got a big heavy vehicle, you want small tube headers. You want small long tubes because long tubes are going to make the compression wave scavenge the cylinder or evacuate the cylinder better at lower RPMs. If you got a high RPM cam and you're running 7, 8,000 RPMs, you want a really short giant header on that thing like a race car. For most street cars, small tube, small long tube headers are going to be the best choice because that's what that does is that puts my compression wave at the valve opening event pulling on the cylinder between about 2500 and 35 to 4000 rpms which is where 95 percent of the street cars are going to run there's a lot going on here you guys and opening that into valve earlier is going to really be beneficial 
especially if I have a tuned exhaust system. So those are the two events you really want to think about. That's intake valve closing and exhaust valve opening. And there's, there's, there's more to this. This is not all there is, but hopefully that gets you where you need to be. Now those camshafts that I talked about earlier, they do a really good job for the LS engines of placing intake valve closing, exhaust valve opening strategically so they really take advantage of the really good cylinder heads on the LS motors. They take advantage of the exhaust systems and the induction and everything. I do recommend headers. If you're gonna build an LS, you really need to get a good set of headers and a decent exhaust system on the thing because uh, the factory exhaust manifolds are, I, they're okay. They're not terrible, but you're not optimizing. And again, these camshafts that I listed, this is for getting optimized power. Keep in mind, you're gonna to have to tune your computer. If you're running a fuel injection, you're gonna to have to put a tune on it for these cams that I gave you. They are not gonna work with a stock tune. I know this is a lot of information, a lot for you to absorb, and believe me, I've just scratched the surface. There's literally been books written on this subject, but I just wanted to give you some general ideas of what we have learned over the years through building and dyno testing and, and all the, it's been a long road. I've been doing this for 30 years. A lot of my friends when I was younger, especially as they were all out having a good time and partying and I was in the shop in the dyno room building engines and I never really had much of a life. I just basically did engines. But I have learned some things.